So sometimes what uh, takes place uh, off air is more interesting that takes place on air. I was just having a discussion with Twin Falls County Prosecuting Attorney Grant Loeb's about Connecticut politics. And I have a friend, he teaches at Quinnipiac University. He's a journalism professor. And he said to me one day, and he was a liberal when he was younger. They have a governor there named Dan Malloy today who's very liberal. And he said to me a few months ago, he said, can we please clone your governor and send him here? Um, so a lot of people around the country, after exposure for a long period of time to certain political persuasions, start to say things in Idaho aren't so bad. You'd agree with that. Oh, things in Idaho are great compared to the rest of the world. <laughs> it's very true. And we have, have our problems, but if you look around, uh, you don't want to be anywhere else. I wanted to open the show today talking about the fact that this is a very busy time for the... So, well, maybe it isn't, because they're just announcing the decisions that... The right. arguments they, have already taken they've place. They've already argued them and written them, but they're issuing them. Supreme Court this week will have a lot of uh, decisions that will be released. One of them yesterday, even though it deals it was narrowly with one case, of, there was a band, rock band, I guess, called The Slants, composed of a, a group of people who are all of Asian ancestry. Uh, they had been refused a trademark because of that name because it was claimed it was a racial slur. They fought this. The court, in an 8 nothing decision, a recusal by the newest justice because he wasn't there for some of the arguments, but in an 8 nothing decision said, sorry, you know, they can have the name if they like it. But the impact, I was reading about the ripple effects on this last night. Uh, the impact across the board means, for instance, the Washington Redskins can't be denied copyright on the name. Uh, campus speech codes that try to control what people say, uh, you know, that, that, that they'll come, they'll fall by the wayside. Uh, and it shows you, in contrast, Canada passed a bill. I read about it at the uh, Heritage Foundation's website this morning. Canada passed a bill yesterday that will criminalize certain speech. For instance, if you have a man who thinks uh, he's a woman and you call him a man, you could, by the new Canadian law, face legal peril for doing that. So the United States, we talked about Idaho versus Connecticut, but the United States versus even some of our closest neighbors is still really, despite what a lot of people would say, quite the breath of fresh air when it comes to liberty. Yeah, I don't know why this, and it's really not much of a surprise, it was an 8-0 decision. Uh, I don't know why people would be surprised by this. It's fairly clear in the Constitution, uh, and I think the court just reiterated it, uh, why people think that there is any power of government to restrict what people say uh, in this country um, I don't know. I mean, th just the fact that they would have had to go to the Supreme Court with this is kind of surprising, but it, the decision isn't surprising to me. Um, you know, people, it, it, the often said the reason that we have the First Amendment protection is not to protect what everybody's saying all day long that's normal, regular, you know, run-of-the-mill conversation. It protects the extreme speech. That's what it's there for. It protects you your ability to say things that are unpopular. And, you know, I think you're right that there, that there are a lot of places, campuses in particular you mentioned, that have gotten to the point where they think it's okay to restrict what people say, and I don't know where they got that idea. Uh, it's not been okay really ever. Um, and so this, this decision doesn't surprise me much, and I think you're right. It will, it will quiet um, a lot of attempts um, in the future and certainly in the near future to to uh, restrict speech. And other countries, I mean, you're right, you mentioned Canada, uh, England is the same way, Germany, I mean, they have restrictions there about what you can name your children. Um, you know, Scandinavian countries, all these places we think of as uh, liberal democracies, um, they restrict what you can say in a lot of different areas. Uh, we, we, we should add to this that I saw some of the, the, the writing um, in, that was released came from two Republican appointees and Alito and Kennedy, but Sotomayor and Kagan, people like the, 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 who were considered the more liberal wing of the court, were wholly behind this decision. Right. Which and, shows you, know, you that over they, the years, uh, attempts to restrict speech have come from both uh, right wing extremists and left wing extremists. So you know, it, it, it just depends on whose ox is being gored, right? Who who wants to stop people from speaking? Uh, but lately, there's been a lot of it in the press and in the in the news, uh, attempts to shout people down and to keep them from speaking and to restrict uh, certain speech on campus and um, codes that tell you what words you can use and you'll be expelled if you say this and expelled if you say that. So um, 
you know, I, I don't think it's, again, I don't think it's surprising that even the, the most liberal members of the court went, you know, along with this in an eight to zero decision because it's, it's fairly well uh, settled law. And when we have unanimous decisions, it seems it really quiets uh, criticism. Yeah, because you know, you're not going to change that, right? You're not, you're not hoping that uh, Donald Trump picks a Supreme Court justice that switches an eight to zero decision. Uh, yeah, it's, not going to happen. You know, not going to ever happen. We wanted to uh, to point out this court will wrap up its term in a few days. Uh, we were talking off air. The majority of the heavy lifting's been done. We're just seeing decisions, many that were made quite some time ago, just right. being released this week. Yes, and it, they why they release them when they do and in what order, I think, is uh, shrouded in mystery. I don't think anybody knows, but they seem to let the really big ones that people are waiting for wait till the end. So, you know, you get a lot of coverage uh, – as they start to release them of the ones that, uh, you know, are sort of important, and then they build in importance, you know, kind of to a grand finale. So we'll see what they release the rest of this term. A lot of other legal news going on in Washington. Uh, I was reading Wesley Pruden's column this morning in the Washington Times, and I think I saw a couple of other pieces from from lawyers and reporters who were talking about the work of a special... Uh, he's not... Technically, a special prosecutor, a special counsel, I guess right. is how it's described. Mm -hmm. But that when Robert Mueller is looking at a particular case, these things tend to suddenly, they call it mission creep. They get a little bit larger. And they weren't looking at Scooter Libby, for instance, right. in the Bush White House. And yet one of the writers was saying, this isn't always a bad thing. He brought up Al Capone. And he said, Al Capone, they couldn't get him on a, a homicide charges, but they were able to get him on tax evasion. So sometimes it's a good thing that prosecutors can expand an investigation, but there's a lot of concern that uh, that in these situations, once you actually put together an office like this, that it just becomes, I think the president used the words witch hunt the other day, that all of a sudden they're trying to turn over. The idea is we've got to find something, and uh, so they're going to just keep beating the bushes until that happens. Well, and if you're on the receiving end of that, I'm sure you would... Uh you'd look at it that way because you wonder what they're really doing. I mean, are they looking at everything? But if you're on the end of the uh, investigators, and, and there's a difference between an investigation and a prosecution. A prosecution is a narrow thing by definition. You have to charge somebody with something specific, and that's what you go into court to prove. Mm -hmm. An investigation, though, can be wide-ranging. And you know, if they find something wrong that they weren't looking for, they're not just going to push it off to the side and say, well this is illegal, but we weren't looking for it, so we'll just ignore it. I mean, they're going to look at everything they find that they think is illegal and determine whether it's prosecutable. So, yeah, it, when you're in in the crosshairs of a wide-ranging investigation like that, I'm sure it can look like a witch hunt to you because you think, boy, they keep looking into everything. When are they going to stop? And I guess they'll stop when money runs out, when their term ends or when they find something that they turn over to a prosecutor and it gets prosecuted or when they clear somebody. Alan Dershowitz is, a, as I understand, a very respected legal mind, uh, and he's been writing about this, teaching constitutional law for many, many years. Uh, he happened to be appearing last night on Fox News Channel with Tucker Carlson. If you could listen to this, here are a few clips of what he happened to say. Uh, he's taking a look at this, and he thinks that this is a bit of a wild goose chase, uh, this is uh, some of his comments from last night. And I think both sides are trying to criminalize too much. If you disagree with people, throw them out of office. Don't elect them. But right. the idea of charging your enemies with political crimes is too prevalent on both sides of the political aisle. What the Democrats are trying to do to President Trump is exactly what some Republican extremists tried to do to Hillary Clinton. Lock her up, throw away the key. But Richard Nixon told his staff to lie, probably destroyed tapes, and paid hush money or try to pay hush money to witnesses. There's no allegations of any independent criminal conduct against uh, President Trump. Now, he keeps saying, and he's been saying it for weeks, there's nothing to see here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I respect the man, but I also realize he's, he's just offering his opinion. Sure, and of course, he has available the same information that you and I do if we read extensively and, uh, and know what we're talking about. He doesn't have whatever information the FBI has or the investigators have at this point. But obviously, I, I agree with what he says at the moment. At the moment, there's been nothing shown 
that, um, that I think is prosecutable. Um, there are all kinds of things that might be bad judgment, that might be uh, foolish things to say, that might be you know, sloppy language uh, from a person who you know, clearly doesn't have experience in politics or law. Uh, but the, to elevate to a, it to a crime, you have to find a statute that's been violated. You have to find a law that's been violated. And, um, you know, any prosecutor that files a charge is going to have to do that. Now, you get to people like Maxine Waters and people like that running around saying, that, you know, he's going to be impeached and they're drawing up impeachment uh, documents and all of that. Uh, those are kind of the things I think Dershowitz is talking about. It's It's an attempt to politically persecute through a semi-legal system uh, your opponents. And that, that gets out of hand. I mean, people have to be able to say things you disagree with in politics as well as, you know, in free speech. In other words, they can't bring them down, but they can win the court of public opinion and hope that that translates at the ballot box next year and in 2020. Right, which is, of course, always okay uh, to attack your opponent for, for differences of opinion. But to try to turn them into either impeachable offenses or criminal prosecutions is a, is a big step. And, you know, hopefully, and I, I have confidence that Mueller is not going to go down that road. I mean, his job is to see if a law is violated. And if a law has been violated, to turn that information over to a federal prosecutor. Uh, and, you know, we'll see whether he finds anything. He's, there's certainly been nothing demonstrated thus far. Well, I, last week, late last <clears> week, <throat> it was said, it was leaked to the press that they were looking at uh, the president for for the potential obstruction of justice, and there was a lot of ink spilled on that over the weekend, and I thought to myself, well, yes, of course. They look at everything. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, I wasn't alarmed by that. It just seemed to me that's the natural course of what they do, and then at the end, they close up the books and make a recommendation one way or another. Sure, and it, it, it all, it, like every investigation and every prosecution, it's got to be driven by the facts, and the spe facts are specific to this incident. Um, if he... It, uh, obstructed justice or attempted to, then that can be a crime. And, you know, depending on what he did, I mean, an offhand comment probably that I hope you don't prosecute my good friend Lynn, he's a good guy, probably doesn't count. The problem is that when you're the president, you say offhanded things and the power of the presidency is behind you when you say them. And so, obviously, it would be smart not to say things like that. Because it could be construed well, of as course. Yeah. you're trying to intimidate the director of the FBI. Right. I mean, if I go to a restaurant and, and they don't give me, they don't comp my meal and I say, how would you like it if a search warrant was done on your place? Um, that speaks a lot l more loudly than if you say it um, because I have, you know, at least potentially and at least the perception might be that I have the power to abuse that you don't. And obviously, the president has the most power of anybody in this country. And when he says sloppy things like that, uh, they're likely to be misconstrued or construed in the least favorable light. We've got more coming up with Grant Lobes, the Twin Falls County prosecuting attorney. We're at 920. It's 77. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, News Radio 1310.com. or comment for the prosecutor. You can get in touch with us after the break at 736. 0300, that's 736 0300. Our studio guest is Twin Falls County Prosecuting Attorney Grant Loeb. He joins us on a monthly basis, generally on a Tuesday morning. 22 minutes after 9 o'clock, it's 76. Bill Colley with you as well. On Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. A question or comment for the prosecutor this morning? Feel free to give us a call at 736 0300, 736 0300. I had a conversation over the weekend with a fellow who uh, he grew up in Twin Falls when it was a city, he said, probably of 20,000 people. And then business took him away for many, many years to a very big metropolitan area. And he came back here, and he's starting to realize that the, the growth in our neighborhood is turning us more and more into what you might call uh, urbanized environment. And he had some thoughts about where that's going to lead. I want to talk to you about that before we wrap up today, but first I'll take a telephone caller. Caller, you're up next. You're on the air with the prosecutor. Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Lowe's. I have two questions for you, and one of them is uh, like yesterday when I was uh, at Walmart with my son. My son is 25 years old, benches about 400, and 
I, I, I train boxers. So it's like this individual was all of a sudden just honking the horn, flipping me, flipping me and my son off. At what point does it count self-defense? Because apparently rhetoric is running rampant, and it's like I don't, I, we don't know this individual from Adam. My son goes, "What do you want? You want me to talk to him?" And I go, "Now, nah, you know what? Let's just the the heat is messing up the natives here. So you know what? Let's just let it let it slide, let it roll, let's go." So we did, but he kept chasing us, and so until he got off, and until I guess the lady that was with him told him to stop, and he, and he stopped. But what I was trying to avoid was, you know, who knows this individual might have a gun, and my son has a permit to carry a gun. And so, you know, I don't, I really don't want to see that. And so that's one question. And uh, the other one, what do you think of um, Sean Spicer not giving any more uh, video or audio of of, of the press conferences. Thank you, Mr. Lopes. Can you please answer that? Road Rage, I guess, is the first uh, account, right? Kind of. Um, you know, uh, I think that the caller handled this exactly right. You you try to walk away. You try to distance yourself from a person. If the person follows you, as, sure. as he indicated, uh, and I, I couldn't tell whether he was driving or, or walking in the store, but um, if the person follows you, then um, that can develop into something violent. Uh, again, that's probably not the person to stop and talk to. That's the person to get away from. Uh, obviously, uh, if it turns violent and if the other person is initiating the violence, you have a right to defend yourself. Um, that's usually the last resort, though, because once you start going down that road, bad things happen, and they continue to happen. He, he cited it happened at a department store where I've seen people yes, just over parking Walmart, spaces yeah. get enraged, and I don't know how many times I've seen the police have to come there to calm things down. Which is the next thing, of course, I was going to say, and that is you know, call the police. Uh, if, if you're in a situation where you can do so safely and you're not in imminent threat of, of bodily harm, uh, if somebody's not coming after you with a knife or a gun or ramming you with their car, uh, you know, call the police and say, hey, there's a jerk out here. He's acting violent. He's, I don't know what he's going to do. Uh, he's disturbing my peace out here. And, you know, the police will show up uh, because they take these things uh, seriously. And if they, if they can get there, they'll get there immediately. Uh, and, you know, maybe this guy's on some kind of drug. Maybe this guy's got some mental problems. Maybe he's just a bad dude. Uh, and in any case, you don't want to, you know, start a fight with him. You don't want to start a verbal argument and have it escalate to somebody, you know, reaching for a knife right. or a gun. So um, I think there is a, a very serious um, loss of inhibitions in society these days that uh, it's, it's, it starts at the top and goes all the way down to a guy in a parking lot at Walmart and, I think you just need to keep your head uh, about you and, and be careful. I mean, uh, things can turn badly quickly. A lot of this is because of our social media culture, sure. which has led yeah. to a lot of that as well. Yep. And um, and I think that people start behaving in ways where they are detached from what is real, and maybe they can't even tell what's real and what's a video game and what's Snapchat and what's Facebook, and they say and do things that you know a generation ago would be unthinkable. There was a, you referenced just trying to get away from a situation like that. There was a column from a newspaper writer in uh, Nampa at the Press Tribune last week. He's a, he trains people in, you know, fire Castle safety. Doctrine column. Yeah. yeah. And Matt Folks, I know Matt, he uh, was a prosecutor uh, up in one of the counties up there. I think he he mirrored County. exactly, he, he bore out what you argued when this was somewhat of a controversial issue during session. It, it pretty much, uh, you were spot on. Mm hmm. This is this. We were headed down that road where we were going to turn this into people just shooting people down because they right. thought right. they might be a threat. Right. And you know we have in this state a uh, a pretty good law that uh, that re that protects your right to defend yourself, uh, to defend your family, to defend your property. But it does have some restrictions that you have to do so reasonably. I mean, you can't just say hey, that guy walked on my land, so I shot him to death. I mean, you have to be reasonable. You have to respond to threats in a reasonable way. And part of the thing that some of the people that were advocating some of these laws, uh, Castle Doctrine laws, 
uh, wanted to take out of Idaho code was the requirement that you behave reasonably. Now, reasonableness is always somewhat subjective. I mean, a jury's going to have to decide, but that's what juries do. Um, juries do that all the time, and they do it they do it well or they do it badly. They certainly don't always do it in the way I agree with, but that's the cross-section of the community decides whether you're reasonable or not. And we don't want a situation where it's okay just to blast people. And I think that was, in part, the, the point of Matt's column. Um, he offered some suggestions about how to word the word, you know, uh, future gun laws but and self-defense laws. But between the self-defense laws and the justifiable homicide laws um, and the protection of your, your habitat and your, your residents, um, uh, I think that there, Idaho offers great protections to people who want to defend themselves. We have to get to the Spicer comment. It wouldn't take long to respond to it, but we'll do that after the break, uh, 9.30. That was related to Sean Spicer doing these uh, briefings uh, away from the press gaggle, and I, I guess that's a controversial issue for the press. 77 right now. And remember, uh, the prosecutor used to work on Capitol Hill. He has some knowledge of how these uh, situations work, and he also has uh, some knowledge of afflictions of the media. Uh, we've got another half hour to go. Top story, Bill Colley with you, of course, on the uh, on the program today. County Prosecutor Grant Loeb's is our guest until 10 o'clock. We've got more coming up. Twin Falls County Prosecutor Grant Loeb's joins us in studio, and uh, he's here until 10 o'clock this morning. He's also available to take some of your telephone calls. Uh, the number is 736-0300. We're at 934. It's 78. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story. A caller uh, brought up, uh, just wanted to know your take on Sean Spicer. He's not doing as many formal press briefings, but he's doing these informal off-the-record talks with selected people in the media. Uh, does that offend you greatly? I don't care. I mean, you know, the the press briefings are all scripted on both sides. I mean, the, the press people go in knowing exactly which question they're going to ask and which gotcha they're going to try to get and often how they're going to report it. And uh, hopefully the press secretary for the president knows what his answer is going to be, and I think that's been part of the problem uh, in that sometimes his answers have not seemed to be well thought out or well researched, and I think he's trying to avoid bad press, and that's what press secretary's job is to do. It's not to be a tool of the press. They are a tool of the president, and uh, if his performance is giving the president bad press, or if they think that that format is not working, they're going to change it. It's not the first time that's happened. And he's not legally required, by the no, way, to do he has, this. He has no legal requirement to ever answer a question from the press. I mean, you know, it's the way we do it in this country, but, um, you know, we had we went through many, many, many months in the Obama administration where there wasn't a single comment, uh, you know, uh, from the president to the press, and he didn't take questions. Uh, and different presidents handle that differently. Some would rather just give a speech. Some would rather give a prepared statement and then walk away. Some stand there for you know many minutes answering whatever questions thrown at them. Um, and I think the environment in the press room uh, has a lot to do with that. This, this reminds me a bit of uh, in the 1940s, the media had gotten used to daily briefings from the First Lady, and then... When President Roosevelt died, Bess Truman came in, and the media was asking her some questions. And they said, how often do you plan to do this? She said, this is my last. Yeah. Well, we need to know what you think. And she said, no, you just need to know what my husband thinks. Bye-bye. But they were infuriated because it changed what they thought was tradition. Yeah. But tradition is not law. And tradition changes all the time. I mean, a John Kennedy press briefing is a lot different than a Nixon press briefing. Uh, you know, and, and if the president themselves is in the room uh, answering the questions, then that's a huge difference. And so every administration does it differently. Um, I think everybody's waiting to see what, if ever, there will be a normal for this administration because they seem to change a lot. Um, but, you know, it's... Uh, it's been a certainly a rocky relationship with the press, and the rockier it is, the more the president's people are going to take measures to try to make sure that they limit themselves to you know damaging press meetings. Many, if they're going to get attacked all the time, they're going to do what they can do to avoid that. I had mentioned a conversation I had with somebody over the weekend about the tremendous population growth we're having in the Magic Valley, and 
back in the 1990s, I was doing a series of interviews with a group of uh, police officers who were, uh, they were some of the national leaders in some of the law enforcement organizations in the country. And I got to know this fellow named Mike Perry, who told me at the time that crime is based, if you have a community of 2,000 and you have 10 crimes a year, if you have 20,000, you can extrapolate, you'll have, you know, 10 times as many and then I had people tell me, well, that's not really true because if you have a crack epidemic or a heroin epidemic, that changes those figures. But the more people you have, obviously, there's always going to be aberrant behavior. The more aberrant behavior you have. We're, we're seeing this phenomenal growth in this valley, construction cranes everywhere. Um, the guy who talked to me the other weekend was very concerned we're going to turn into an urban area with a lot of urban crime. Don't we already have, to a degree, the yeah, same thing? I think we already are that in... Uh to a significant degree. I mean, Idaho uh, has a low crime rate compared to other states. Uh, Twin Falls has a low crime rate compared to other cities in other states. But um, Idaho's crime rate is increasing. Uh, Twin Falls' crime rate is increasing. And, um, y you know, your, your comment about the population increase, the population increase doesn't tell you what the crime increase is uh, going to be. Because, um, in fact, you know, I'm, I was discussing this with some people the other day who were trying to you know, get a handle on planning for the future with our court system. And the question was asked whether, you know, we should plan for, you know, if we have a 10% increase in population, should we expect a 10% increase in crime? And I said, no. Um, the crime rate in Twin Falls always exceeds the increase in population. So if the, if the population increases 20%, your crime rate's going to increase 20% because more people are here, plus some. And the reason it's plus some is the bigger we get, the more we attract. We attract people from all over the place. Uh, Highway 93 from you know Nevada up to you know Sun Valley and beyond is a, a major thoroughfare for drug trafficking, uh, and that's going to continue. Uh, we we are on or very near an interstate. That's that makes us a, a stopping place for criminals who don't live here, mm -hmm. and being the only population center uh, for a long way in every direction, north, south, east, and west, we have people from all over coming here to do shopping, to spend their money, to recreate, and to commit crimes. Hold that thought for a moment. We'll get back to that in just a moment. It's 940. We're at 78 still. Grant Lobes, the Twin Falls County Prosecuting Attorney, joining us in studio on Top Story with Bill Culley on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. 18 minutes before 10 o'clock, it's 77. Uh, Twin Falls County Prosecutor Grant Lobes is in studio with us until 10 o'clock this morning. The telephone number, if you'd like to reach him, 736. If you've got a question or comment pertaining to uh, law, prosecution, and courts, 736-0300. Uh, Bill Colley as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Let me correct the temperature. We just had a spike. It now reads 81, so maybe the clouds, the clouds broke. You, we were talking a bit about the population growth here, and just before break, you said that if there's a 20% population growth, there's a corresponding percentage growth with crime, mm -hmm. and then maybe a few more and percentage some, points. Yeah. Are we going to have to build? I saw this happen in a county where I lived where they had to build, uh, a, they had a beautiful old courthouse built in the 1800s, late 1800s, and they literally had to build across the street several new courtrooms, and so they had to expand and do that. Now, Taxpayers start saying, well, I don't know about that. But at some point, if we we're likely in the 50,000 range when it comes just to city population and just to drive anywhere outside the city, the building boom continues. Uh, we could be at 75,000 people in the city in a matter of a few years. There's only going to be so much space available to bring people in, and you, you're going to need courtroom space, new judges. You may need a bigger staff as well. If you've got more crime, you need more, you know, deputies working in the office as well. People better be prepared for all of this. Well, sure, it's it's inevitable. And you know, the only way to to preclude that is to stop growth. And, you know, you, you could, I mean, the, the city of Twin Falls um, has a very pro-growth strategy. I mean, they want more business, they want mm -hmm. more people, they want more tax base. Um, there are cities in the country that do everything they can to stop growth, uh, to stop people from coming in. They stop issuing water permits and such so that people can't build houses. But I don't think that anybody wants that because it stifles the economy. 
So if, if you're going to continue to have growth, you're going to have to grow in the areas in government that are needed to control that growth. And, um, you know, that's the, the county commissioners have been talking about uh, having, you know, looking to the future for the court facilities and for the jail facilities. And, you know, every time you talk about this, of course, you get people say, I don't want to pay for a new jail. And, you, you know, these things go up for, for bonds and you see them all the time. They fail and they fail and then ultimately sometimes they pass. Um, we saw the Jerome jail bond go how many times? I don't know. Uh, but the fact is you're going to need more, um, and you're going to need more courtrooms. You're going to need a bigger uh, court facility. And in Twin Falls, we do have, like you just said, the old, you know, early 1900s courthouse, which, which no longer has courtrooms in it. Um, and next to it, uh, because of the growth that was needed many years ago to get out of that one building, uh, we have the court facility, which has... Um, two district courtrooms and three magistrate courtrooms um, and other facilities. The, down the road, very, very quickly, I think, uh, we're going to outgrow that. If I mean, really, we already have. The question is, what is the next step? And I think the next step is going to be to build a, um, a quality building that's going to uh, take, uh, take our growth into the next 30, 20, 30, 50 years. Uh, and that will last and, you know, maybe even that can be added to uh, because um, if you continue to grow your town, you're going to need to continue to grow your jail facility, your court facilities, your police departments, your prosecutors, your public defenders. Um, all of these things need to grow with the population and, and even more so in law enforcement with the crime rate. Well, and you referenced Jerome. I know that in Jerome and Gooding uh, counties, they had lots of opposition to new jails, and then there was an argument, well, they're not yet full, but the thing is, they're going to be filled. Sure. And then some, the, the, the yeah. right things are going. Yeah, I mean, it's always, it's always a catch-up game, right? I mean, you're always going to be trying to plan for the future, and that you don't know exactly what the future will be, but you know the future will be more. Um, you know, we hope that crime rate will go down. We hope that the drug problem will will be alleviated. We hope that, you know, people will learn to live peacefully with their neighbors and, you know, not assault people over parking spaces in the Walmart parking lot. But the fact is, the more people you have, um, the more crime you're going to have. And the more crime you have, the more facilities you have to have to deal with it. And that, you know, referencing Walmart, and you referenced how this area has become the shopping center for Parts of three states. Sure. And, and so you have all of those people coming in, and they're trying to crowd into these parking spaces. They're clogging streets. You're going to have and, – and the other thing that happens in these parking lots, I lived in a city where a massive mall was built. I mean, it was six stories high, and it was done because they thought it would help turn the city's finances around, which it briefly did, and then things took a nosedive because it was, we'll point out, controlled by Democrats. Uh, and they, 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 they had to keep giving goodies away left and right. But I remember the police officers said that within two years, the highest crime rate in the county was that mall parking lot. Mm -hmm. And it was mainly just small-time crimes, purse snatchings, those types of things that were going on. They had to hire a huge security force privately just to patrol it. So when we, we, we look at Pole Line Road and you see all of the shops and stores that up and down that street – you realize that you can't have a police officer there in every parking lot. Uh, you're going to see more and more of these types of small-time crimes, maybe even some large sure. ones that will come along. Well, crime follows the population, just like everything else, right? I mean, uh, the, the criminals are in the business of feeding on the rest of the people. Uh, either they go to where the population is to sell their drugs because they need people who will buy, or they go to where the population is to steal things because you have to steal from other people, or you know they they go to the shopping and then they go out for six beers and they drive on our streets. I mean, uh, whatever type of crime you're talking about is increased when you increase the population. And I don't want you know to be alarmist and make it sound like you know Twin Falls is you know going to become um, a horrible place to live. Um, it's the crime rate here is still. Um, well below what it is in, you know, most places you'll go. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the, the police and the prosecution and the courts have it, you know, you know, 
know, under, under control to the extent that this thing is ever under control. Uh, it's not a runaway problem. But we, one of the reasons it's not is because we are up to date and we, we have to continue to stay up to date. So we can't say things are great now, let's just keep what we've got for the next 20 years and things will still be great. No, they won't. Um, you'll have not enough people, not enough places, not enough courtrooms, not enough jail spaces, not enough anything to deal with things if you just stay static. With, we're also dealing with a drug epidemic in the way of heroin and meth that is like nothing, obviously, people have ever seen before. But we have some experience in the 1980s with the crack cocaine epidemic, which when that hit the streets in the mid-80s, everyone thought that this was going to be a perpetual problem. Looking back on the late 1980s with sentencing guidelines, especially the federal courts, um, mandatory sentences and the like, it seems a little harsh, maybe draconian now today when we look back on it. But I guess we tend to forget that it cleaned. We don't hear about crack cocaine epidemics any longer. Well, no, and you you know you you go from one thing to another, right? You go from crack cocaine to methamphetamine. Now heroin's coming up again, um, and you know harsh prison sentences don't solve everything for sure. But you know if if you have a type of behavior and you want to deter it, um, one of the things that you have to do that with is prison sentences. I mean, if people continue to come here from Utah and sell huge amounts of heroin, um, they will be less likely to do so if they know they're going to go to prison for 20 years when they're caught. They will be more likely to do so if they know they're going to get probation. Um, that doesn't mean that every single person who you catch with heroin or with cocaine or with methamphetamine should go to prison because some of those people are users where when we need to look at the rehabilitation and treatment side for most of those people. But the big sentences that people talk about, the big mandatory minimum sentences, are for people who have huge amounts of whichever drug it is and who are intending or actually selling it to people. And, you know, big sentences stop people from doing that because that is a business. And they calculate the odds of getting caught, the punishment they're going to receive, and whether they can tolerate that for the money they're going to make. Just like any other business, they have just different calculations they put in there. I mean, if you run a sporting goods shop, you don't, have, you don't factor in the prison term. Um, you've, but these people have to because that's the cost of doing business. In my younger libertarian period in life, I used to argue with people in law enforcement and prosecution about laws against gambling, uh, laws against prostitution, and laws against drugs, saying, look, people are going to do it, let them do it. Uh, the, the problem is if somebody's running a house of prostitution next door, it, it tends to attract the other problems as well, the drugs, uh, other crime, assaults, sometimes homicides. And I think that's what we lose track of. And we have a lot of people in Idaho pushing that libertarian agenda when it comes to crime. And we have to make some serious choices in the next couple of years about what direction we're going to go. Sure. And, you know, it's a, it's a question that, that the legislature and whoever the next governor is and citizens themselves need to ask themselves, uh, what kind of a society do I want to live in? Um, go, go to, uh, uh, Denver and go walk downtown, walk to your favorite, you know, quilt shop, your favorite, uh, record store, your favorite, you know, whatever, go find it and see what it is now. Most likely it's a marijuana dispensary shop or it's next door to one. That's fine. If that's what you want. Um, but that is the choice that people are going to have to make. Do you want to have uh, Boise look like downtown Denver? Yes or no. I mean, some people will say, sure, I would like that. Some people are going to say, no, I didn't move to Idaho for that. Um, with regard to some of these other things, sure. I mean, the same thing is true with, with gambling, with, uh, with uh, prostitution, with you know whatever you want. Um, it, these are choices societies make. Uh, citizens make them and their representatives make them. If you want prostitution to be legal in Twin Falls and if you want to live next door to a place where that business is running uh, and down the street from a place that's selling recreational marijuana and you want to have low punishments for people that are selling heroin on the street, all of these things are up to citizens to decide. Um, but look at the society you're going to have if you do that. Uh, and make sure that you understand what that's going to be. Don't just pass this and say, as some people I know who are from Colorado did, well, it's going to be great. We're going to get all this money for schools. 
Well, not really. Almost all that money goes to regulating the now legal marijuana industry. Almost none of it's going to schools. Um, and it's transformed that society. Um, you know, there's a little town just, you know, the, the first town in Oregon that on your way east or west that sells marijuana. Uh, they've got a lot of business. They've got a lot more people coming into town, but it is now a marijuana town. As Governor Otter said, when he talks to, uh, and we brought this up the last time we were here, when he talks to Governor Brown in Oregon and Governor Hickenlooper in Colorado, they have serious regrets about having gone down this path. Sure, because of what their states have become now. And and we, we wanted to point out, too, as well, when I was younger, I may have had that sort of laissez-faire attitude about all of this. It's strange, though, once you have children, and then you have a reaction that says, I don't want my kids to see this. Mm-hmm. And and that's where it starts changing your outlook, I think. And you might buy a house, and you don't want to have a house by it. <laughs> right. I mean, and, you know, I understand people saying, well, you know, if it doesn't hurt anybody, why do we care? Go ahead and do it. It doesn't hurt me if my neighbor wants to go to a prostitute down the street. And if the prostitute wants to be a prostitute, it doesn't hurt her either, as long as she's, you know, being treated right and all. And that there's some truth to that, I suppose, from a purely libertarian do what you want as long as it doesn't hurt your anybody else mm-hmm. philosophy. But what does it do to the place you live? And that's the harder question and the bigger question to ask. And I guess if you're a libertarian, you ask yourself, um, what does the fact that everybody's doing whatever the heck they want to do do to the rest of the community? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? If you think it's a good thing, then I guess, you know, there will be candidates on the ballot for you to vote for yeah. and vote for them. You know, uh, and but, there, are, there are states, obviously, where you can relocate that you would be more comfortable. Uh, but the idea is that the overwhelming majority of the population here wants these things regulated at this moment. Sure. And, and you know, things change. I mean, there we used to, you know, because often in the marijuana debate you hear, well, we had prohibition, you know, and, and you know, alcohol's worse than marijuana. Well, whatever. I mean, whether it is or isn't. One quench your thirst ways. on a hot day. But. Well, yeah. But, but you know, you, you had, um, those are decisions that people make. Um, we have, as a society, made a decision that it's okay to have a bar and it's okay to serve alcohol. We could make a decision that it's okay to do the same with marijuana, but before we do so, we better take uh, uh, the lead of these states and look at what they've done. I mean, there are states that are going down this road, and if we wait a year or a couple of years, we already have good data, but the, the longer we wait, the more we'll get. Let's watch and see what those places look like in five years before we rush in to follow them. Uh, sometimes being a little bit behind the curve is a good thing because you can see whether the guy ahead of you gets hit by a freight train. That's like the line a friend of mine told me I worked with years ago. He said, I, I was looking at a brand new model of car that had been introduced, and he said, wait till next year and buy it because he said they'll get all of the yeah the troubles Ideally, out of it. Yeah, yeah uh, in the first year, and then by year two you'll be fine. The engineers will have corrected everything they may have overlooked. Right. Similar to that. We've got to wrap up, but for people who'd like to get in touch with you, uh, the office number is? 736-4020. We should point out you're not on Facebook. No. Yes. <laughs> not likely to be. Grant Loeb's in studio with us. We'll see him again in a few weeks. We're coming up on 10 o'clock at News from Fox. Rush Limbaugh's program afterwards. Sean Hannity at 1 o'clock today. Glenn Beck at 4. Dave Ramsey at 7 o'clock tonight. Uh, God willing, the creek don't rise. They'll allow me to come back and do this all over again tomorrow morning between 8 and 10 o'clock.